All right, good morning, Image LA. How are y'all doing? You good? Is this voice okay, or do I need to go softer? And I'm excited to be here for this morning's message because I get to do a mix of two things. I get to get us back into the scripture text in Matthew uh, in our Who is Jesus a message series. Uh, and then just before uh, coming up here, we decided that actually Daniel's going to do a little reintroduc- uh, reintroduction to the series for us but we're not going to do that until after the question of the day. So the other thing I get to do is I get to share with you some words that I had the privilege of sharing uh, to uh, some of the children at my home church. So before I proceed to pray, though, I want to ask a couple questions that are not the question of the day. Uh, You can give responses if I hear you great. If not, it's just an exercise for you to vocalize some things. Uh, So how have you been enjoying some of these questions worth asking that you have been exploring recently? Yeah, a thumbs up. Okay, okay. So uh, that's, this is one of the reasons why we're going to do a reset, but we're not doing a reset until after the question today for a specific reason. Uh, how have you been enjoying the exploration of God's beautiful design as men and women? Okay, a little bit more recognition of what's going on there. Well, today, after um, we uh, will, after the question today, we're going to get into the scripture text from Matthew, which will be from chapter 19, verses 1 through 15. And we get a very, everyone's probably favorite topic, not really, we get to address divorce. Jesus' address of divorce, among other things, oddly enough, reconfirms God's beautiful design of us as being created in his image as male and female. Then there's a cool interaction uh, in the scripture text where Jesus indicates that the children are to not be prevented from coming to him. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Uh, Let's spend some time in prayer right now. Would you bow our heads as we uh, pray some more? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for who you are, who you've shown yourself to us to be. We ask that you would allow us to live those lives that are worthy of the calling we have received. We ask, Lord, that there would be a sense of humility in the way that we operate so that we um, are able to have a correct posture before you, not coming before you with chest thumping and bravado and pride, but rather with that type of childlike faith, not childish, but childlike faith that opens our eyes and allows us to be able to receive that which you have for us. And so, Lord, we ask that there would be, there's so many different things that will be communicated this morning. We pray, Lord, that you have a custom-made message for each one of us, even as you allow me by your grace to properly divide the word of truth and stay true to the scripture text. It's in Jesus' name that we do indeed pray. Amen. Amen. So I may not be a parent, but one thing I know about kids is that they tend to love to ask a lot of questions. Would you agree? How many of you have ever, did, do this by a show of hands, how many of you have ever been around a kid or a bunch of kids that asked you a bunch of questions? Yeah, so they like to ask questions. So in light of some of these recent things that we've been doing uh, uh, here at Image LA that's been away from this series uh, in Matthew, uh, and some of these questions worth asking, I want to share a few of the answers I give to children. Uh, when I say children, they were uh, two years old through fifth grade, I think. So children that I give to uh, the home church that I serve at. So I'm going to share four of the five questions uh, and the answers that I give them here. And I'll save the fifth one, uh, the fifth question and answer for the closing of this morning's message. In each of these four answers, I use the translation of the Bible called the International Children's Bible. So I use the different translation than we typically uh, use when we're preaching. And I also, for one reference, I also use the New International Version. Mind you, as I already alluded to a few moments ago, when I actually shared with the children, it turned out to be there was a two-year-old there and a four-and-a-half-year-old. So um, I actually, for example, I didn't really follow the script I wrote out that I'm going to share a few of the full scripts I wrote out. Uh, so, for example, in one case, I only read the first sentence of the scripture passage because there was a two-year-old and a four-and-a-half-year-old there, and I had to pay attention to the audience who was there. First question. Is Jesus God? The short answer is yes. When we read the Bible, it is very clear that there is only one God. However, when we look at the Bible, we see three seemingly different characters as being divine or God. They are God the Father, God the Son, also known as Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. The word we try to use to recognize that there is one true God 
but all three are indeed God is Trinity. Do any of you know that Jesus is also sometimes called the Word? And John chapter 1, verses 1 through 2 from the International Children's Bible reads, Before the world began, there was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Another question the children posed, basically they posed this question a week before I came in to the children's ministry uh, teacher, and then she came and was like, hey, you're a pastor, can you answer these questions and come in next week? So another question they asked was, how can Jesus fit in my heart? How can Jesus fit in my heart? You might be surprised, but this is the hardest one for me to answer. When adults use the word heart as it is used in this question, we are talking about more than a physical heart that is inside your chest or that you may have seen in pictures. So if you are thinking of a physical heart and how can Jesus be that small, that is, that is not what we mean. So what do we mean? I'm doing this as scripted. Well, if I don't give a helpful answer, we will see if Miss Holly can help us out. Uh, the way adults use the word heart will likely make more sense when you grow up. But for now, we can think of heart as representing everything that you think and believe. In Romans 10, verses 9 through 13, we read, If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from death, then you will be saved. We believe with our hearts, and so we are made right with God. And we declare with our mouths to say that we believe, and so we are saved. Verse 11, as the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be disappointed. That scripture says anyone because there is no difference between Jew and and non-Jew. The same Lord is the Lord of all and gives many blessings to all who trust in him. The scripture says anyone who asks the Lord for help will be saved. Once again, that's Romans 10 verses 9 through 13. So in one sense, when we say Jesus fits into my heart, we are saying that he has come into my life and now has a say in everything I think and believe. Another question these kids had, why is Jesus the Son of God? Why is Jesus the Son of God? That, this is a very good question, and I imagine once again that as you get older, you're going to hear better answers to this question. However, he is the Son of God because the Father gave him that role and said he is. Jesus also was pleasing to the Father. In Matthew 3, verses 16 through 17, we read, As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. A voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. However, not always, but sometimes when you look at a friend of yours, you might think that your friend looks just like his or her, mom or dad. And so one reason Jesus is the son of God is that he looks just like God. Now, God in reality is a spirit that we can't see, yet the Bible lets us know that Jesus is the exact representation of God. Those are just some big words to tell us that Jesus is exactly like his dad. And that is one reason why Jesus is the Son of God in a way different than we are, his children. Colossians 1, 15 through 17 reads, No one has seen God, but Jesus is exactly like him. Christ ranks higher than all the things that have been made. Through his power, all things were made, things in heaven and on earth, things seen and unseen, all powers, authorities, lords, and rulers, all things were made through Christ and for Christ. Christ was there before anything was made, and all things continue because of him. And our fourth question, why did the religious leaders not want Jesus to be God's son? Why did the religious leaders not want Jesus to be God's son? Well, friends, if Jesus turned out to be God's son, they would have had to have taken Jesus more seriously. 
If Jesus was God's son, that would mean Jesus had a special relationship with God the Father that the religious leaders didn't have. Some of the religious leaders were likely even jealous of Jesus. Others knew they would have to change the way they lived if Jesus was really God's son. And just like it could be hard for both adults and children today to make changes, it would have been very hard for these religious leaders to change the way they lived, led others, and thought if Jesus was God's son. And the other sad answer is that many of these religious leaders didn't truly believe in God. John 8, 47 reads, He who belongs to God accepts what God says, but you don't accept what God says because you don't belong to God. So those are some good questions, and it's time for yet another question. Technically, it's two, and this is the question of the day, and it's going to allow for some immediate processing. So our question of the day is, what do you think of these four answers, and how would you have answered these questions? So you can discuss amongst yourselves, what do you think of these four answers, and how would you have answered these questions? All right, you guys, if you guys want to turn your attentions back up, um, hopefully that was helpful. Just a, a reminder, I mean, a big part of, um, for, first of all, early on, it was really just me, and I didn't really have a network of awesome brothers in Christ who can come up and, like, proclaim the word of God, which is great. And as much as possible, anything I can do to make you guys feel like church is not me coming up and shouting at you for 45 minutes or 40 minutes or whatever it is, and that we are the body of believers gathered together, trying to look more and more like the church in Acts, where we can actually wrestle with this stuff and, and truthfully kind of gauge where we're at before we dive into a message um, to try and see, okay, do we believe Jesus is God? Do we, do we actually believe and trust his teachings? Are we willing to surrender to him, or do we kind of take his advice like we take the advice of a friend? We hear it, and if it's already what we were thinking, we'll go ahead and do it. But if it wasn't, then we'll just ignore it and pretend they're stupid, right? Like, that's kind of how we are sometimes. And that's actually a, a perfect segue into um, coming back to our series, which is entitled, Who is Jesus? And it's been a study through the book of Matthew, and we're on chapter 19. We've literally been going slowly through since Easter two years ago, studying the gospel. And the main question is, who is Jesus? And the truth is, everyone has an answer to the question, who is Jesus? But sometimes that answer doesn't actually come from the Bible. It actually comes from maybe worldly sources or portrayals we've seen on TV or an amalgamation of all the different churches we've been to and religions. And, and you start drifting away from who Jesus is. And then you read the Bible and you're like, that doesn't seem like Jesus. But the problem is the Bible is how we're supposed to see who Jesus is. So if you're reading the Bible and it disagrees with your view of who Jesus is, maybe your view of Jesus isn't quite accurate. Maybe this view of Jesus as a pacifist hippie and not one who is actually zealous for the righteousness of God might not be true to the word of God, right? Maybe this view of Jesus as this tolerant person who doesn't care, do whatever you want, whenever you want, that's fine. How could you be wrong? That's not what Jesus is. Jesus speaks the truth in love always. It's always in love. It's always from a place of wanting your best, wanting God's best for your life. But he does not compromise on the truth. He's not willing to say, you know what? You're right. I'm wrong. I know I created the whole world, but you're probably right. You figured it out better than I have. That's not who Jesus is. You see, if God has decided to reveal himself in the person and work of Jesus Christ, we ought to know who he really is and not just who we want him to be. Not recreating a God in our own image that lets us do what we want when we want, but instead actually knowing who Jesus is. So you guys, we mentioned that we've taken a break from that as, as I've kind of been going through these retreats and, and preaching to the kids in chapel. One of them's right here. Um, two of them, actually, which is so great. But um, once again, I, I want to be prayerful and not be so overly structured that I'm like, no, we're doing this series. I don't care what you say, God. No, I want to be receptive. And for the past few weeks, I feel like God really did put it on my heart to invite you guys into that and share with you guys some of the stuff that's going on there. And there's been some awesome fruit happening over there as well just continuing to grow my heart, continuing to grow the heart of the kids over at Heritage and, and us as a church. I think this has been an awesome season, but I'm so excited because Randolph's going to come bring it back to Matthew 19, verses 1 through 15. So I'm going to go ahead and read it for him this morning. If you guys want to turn there, we're from the English Standard Version, Matthew 19, verses 1 through 15. And guys, I, I think Randolph was very wise to set the stage for remember that we're not God and he is. So if you read the Bible and you don't like what it says, let's wrestle with it a little bit. But once again, our opinions don't really change truth, right? Like we, we want to know what's true. We want to know God's best. And we want to continue to preach the truth in love, but actually surrender to the word of God. And where the ideal is lacking, where we have fallen short, where we all sin and struggle, of course, grace abounds all the more. 
And yet we're going to read the word of God and still continue to strive for his best, even when we've dropped the ball, even when we failed moving forward, okay? So Matthew 19, verses 1 through 15. It says, Now when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. And the Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking him, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And he said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And they said to him, Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? He said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And the disciples said to him, if such, is the case, uh, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it, it is better not to marry. But he said to them, not everyone can receive this saying, but only those to whom it is given. There are those eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are those who have been made eunuchs by men, and there are some who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive it, receive it. Then children were brought to him, that he might lay his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked the people, but Jesus said, let the little children come to me. And do not hinder them, for to such belong the kingdom of heaven. And he lays his hands on them, and he went away. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. So it's not going to be a major focus of today's message, but as we're getting back into Matthew, I do want you to note that Jesus' Galilean ministry has ended, and he now enters the region of Judea. So for those of you who are good at thinking in terms of geography, you are going to want to keep that in mind, even though that's not a focus of today's message. So sure enough, Jesus arrives in Judea, and the Pharisees, a set of religious leaders, show up. So I guess the kids I referenced earlier this morning were correct in asking, why did the religious leaders not want Jesus to be the Son of God? And so we have another instance in which the Pharisees try to test Jesus who from their perspective is merely purporting, merely claiming to be divine. Jesus is very perceptive, and he does not fall for their trap. So Jesus gives an answer that basically tells them, you're asking the wrong question. Or perhaps more bluntly, you don't really know what you're talking about. Jesus takes them back to God's beautiful design. They were created from the beginning as male and female. Furthermore, Jesus upholds marriage and points out that man is not to separate what God has put together. The Pharisees try to assess the lawfulness of divorce by essentially presenting a hot topic of the day question that is also a law question to Jesus. And so what Jesus does is he takes them back to God's original intent and in effect makes reference to a higher law. Jesus points out that the one flesh relationship that is marriage, and he emphasizes that, reaffirms it, and he indicates that in God's original design, divorce is not an option. And this is why in Christian premarital counseling, it will be suggested to you, if not straight up outright told to you, that you must enter into marriage without divorce being an escape option. Now you can imagine, however, as this exchange unfolds, that some of these Pharisees are like salivating at the mouth as they finally believe they got Jesus. Yes, Jesus brought up God's beautiful design, but Jesus' references are to uh, some portions of Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. And this is stuff that occurred before the fall. There is divorce, and Moses himself permitted divorce. What do you have to say about that, Jesus? What are you going to say to that precious brother or sister that dearly loves Jesus and has been divorced, Pastor Randolph? As to the latter question, we will get back to that later. For now, I just want to say, do not fail to remember God's grace and redemptive work in our lives as you tune in to what the scriptures indicate 
in today's scripture text. Jesus basically lets them know, yes, things are different due to sin, but you are wrong again. Moses did not command divorce. Moses did allow divorce because of the sinfulness of humans, because of the sinfulness of man. Then Jesus affirms God's beautiful design from the beginning once again. Jesus upholds the sanctity of marriage. It is not to be entered into lightly, and it is not to be exited on mere whims. Pretty simple and straightforward, right? And yet Jesus adds complexity to this issue when he points out that sexual morality can be a grounds for a divorce. Oh, no. Just like Moses, Jesus is providing an exception clause in which divorce is permissible. And Jesus also introduces the word adultery here. So yes, later in this message, I will say more about this when I talk more about divorce. However, here, as the scripture story unfolds, the disciples themselves now speak up. And they're thinking, it seems like they might be getting it. They're like, wow, marriage is a big deal. I might as well not even try. And Jesus basically says, not so fast. Being married is hard, but being single is hard too. Not everyone, in fact, probably very few, can go to distance without wanting that one flesh union that is marriage. Jesus commends singleness just as he commends marriage, pointing out that singleness is valid. Now, I just got to be honest with you. Note that this is a celibate singleness, uh, and this is why not many can accept it. It's not running out there, playing the field, or running through as many dudes or gals as you can. This is a celibate singleness. Friend, make neither the mistake of thinking that celibacy is some exalted spiritual state and look down on the married, nor think that marriage is some exalted spiritual state and look down on the single. There needs to be an acceptance and understanding of the position and gift that God has given to everyone. Now, interestingly enough, in this way the scripture passage unfolds, some children arrive, and Jesus quickly teaches that we must have the humility of children when approaching him, And then he also quickly teaches that he has time for and receives actual children. Jesus likely was even reinforcing the value he places on the family and all stages of life by laying his hands on children right after a discussion of marriage and divorce. As mentioned, we are going to come back and work through some of the implications of what Jesus says here related to divorce. For some of you, God's Spirit will minister to you, perhaps even in a surprising way, even if your life has somehow been negatively affected by divorce. For some of you, there may be disappointment as you assess what I'm prompted to say. That is soft. Doesn't he know God hates divorce? Or that is strong. Doesn't he know that over half of Christians happen to be divorced and we serve a gracious God? Why is he talking so much or so little about remarriage and adultery? Before we get back to this perhaps delicate subject of divorce, I want to ask you a question, and hopefully you were helped by uh, Pastor Daniel's reset. What is the name of this current sermon series? Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? So, while what is said about divorce may be the main takeaways for some of you because that's where God's scripture is taking us. As far as I am concerned, the main points of this sermon are the three statements answering who is Jesus that I will share a few momentarily. You may learn more new stuff later or more you disagree with or more you actually have to prayerfully read the scriptures about on your own that can't be covered in one short message. But do not lose sight of who Jesus is revealing himself as Uh, in this morning's scripture text. And I'm actually going to give you all three statements at the same time, uh, so I'll have to pause a little so your brains can process through them. But who is Jesus? Jesus is he who confirms the goodness of being created male and female. Think of that. Get that in mind. Jesus is he who confirms the goodness of being created male and female. Who is Jesus? 
Jesus is he who uplifts both marriage and singleness. Jesus is he who uplifts both marriage and singleness. And who is Jesus? Jesus is he who values little children and humility. Jesus is he who values little children and humility. So even if today is the type of message that grates at your heart because of something that happened in the past or just it just doesn't sit well with you because it doesn't fit with the script and the world that we find ourselves living in, don't allow that to distract you from the fact that Jesus confirms the goodness of being created male and female. He uplifts both marriage and singleness, and he values little children and humility. And so before we proceed, let's uh, pray briefly. Lord God, I pray that you would uh, minister to us and speak to our hearts, prepare our hearts for what needs to be communicated, and that you would allow us, yes, your word does cut to the core. It divides even bones and sinews and marrows, as it indicates in Scripture. Uh, we thank you also that uh, your Scripture is useful for teaching, rebuke, correcting, and reproof, all that beautiful stuff. But we pray, Lord, that even in this morning's message, you allow us to have eyes to see who you are and get the reminder that in this interaction, you have really upheld uh, Jesus reinforces the beautiful design that God has made, the beautiful design of creating us as male and female, the beautiful design of partnership, whether it is within marriage or singleness, and then the beautiful design of your accepting everyone and particularly valuing those who come before you with humility, a childlike faith, and also that you were never too important to pay attention to children. And we thank you, Lord, that one of the main descriptions of the way we connect to you as is children of yours. Minister and speak to your children today, even as we might have to do some wrestling with your word this morning and today afternoon. In Jesus' name, we do indeed pray. Amen. So we're going to ease back into this issue of divorce with stuff from my personal experience. So at this point in my life, I've only officiated uh, four weddings. So I've officiated four weddings. One has ended in divorce already. Uh, the female in that relationship is remarried already and has a child with her new husband. From the other three marriages, uh, six children have resulted. Uh, one of the marriages had a pre-existing child before I officiated that wedding. And I have had family members... Uh, who would drop hints that they would like me to officiate their weddings. Uh, in fact, one was dropped again recently. I just told that person we will see, uh, so we'll see what happens. But while not a biblical requirement, I won't officiate a wedding unless that person has gone through premarital counseling. One family member said to me, even for someone as old as me, yes, even for someone as old as you, another family member was considering marrying someone who had been divorced. I wouldn't officiate that wedding because the divorced person's counterpart had not been remarried. In my mind, there was a chance of reconciliation, and at that period in my life, I apparently didn't consider the marriage dead upon divorce, but rather the death or remarriage of the counterpart. Now, my view may be a little more lax now, in part due to preparing to teach this morning's message, but only a little. Why? Well, it is due to a better but still in flux understanding of Jesus' exception clause. When there is sexual immorality on one side of the marriage that results in divorce, the unoffending party is free to marry again. The unoffending party need not wait for the offending party to die or remarry before being a candidate for marriage again. And now we shall introduce... Uh, a new scripture text, Deuteronomy 24, verses uh, 1 through 4, uh, into this uh, exploration of scripture and discussion of divorce. So Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 through 4, from the English Standard Version reads, When a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, and she departs out of his house, and if she goes and becomes another man's wife, and the latter man hates her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter man dies who took her to be his wife, then her former husband, who sent her away, 
may not take her again to be his wife after she has been defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord. And you shall not bring sin upon the land that the Lord your God has given you for an inheritance. Heavy stuff, but still bless the reading of the Lord's word. We will come back to verse 1 relatively soon because that is more relevant to what unfolded in Matthew chapter 19, verses 1 through 15. However, here in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 2 through 4, we have a clear reference to remarriage. Now, this specific example of remarriage has ended in either death or divorce. However, the former husband is not to take this surviving woman as a wife again. Now, this may seem odd, and it did to me, but even this is meant to be an illustration of the high view of marriage that the scriptures communicate. Don't divorce too quickly, folks, not only because of not even playing with breaking apart what God has put together, but you may want to get back with your original at some point in time. However, you are not allowed because that marriage is dead and you are now committed to your new marriage. Interestingly enough, here in Deuteronomy, even when the new marriage is over, you can't go back to your old marriage. Now, I do have to point something out. Because of something in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39, which I will tell you shortly, it is possible that you will find a genuine minister of God who would be do, willing to do a remarriage of a woman to her first husband after the second husband died, despite what is said here in Deuteronomy. So what does 1 Corinthians 7.39 say? 1 Corinthians 7.39 from the English Standard Version reads, A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. What is the takeaway? Because this is details, and some of you aren't getting to flip in your Bible to so all these passages. What is the takeaway? God has a high view of marriage. Don't enter marriage lightly. Don't try to go into it with an escape clause. Even if you're on your second go-round for whatever reason, you still need to have a high view of the sanctity of marriage. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1, you may have noticed the phrase, some indecency in her. Some indecency in her. What does that mean? Well, that is what the Jewish leaders and specifically the Pharisees were wrestling with in Matthew 19. So there was one school led by a rabbi named Rabbi Hillel who essentially said you can divorce for any reason. Divorces were happening for things as petty as bread being burnt. Uh, so, it, I mean, yeah. And then, uh, I don't remember the name, but another rabbi downstream, um, I'll, I'll use cruder language since I don't remember the direct quote, but basically, like, if you saw someone else hotter, you can divorce your current one and get the hot, hottie. Like, they were really being pretty irresponsible. Then you had another school led by Rabbi Shammai, and he said that divorce can only happen in the case of adultery. Obviously, that seems a little bit closer to the scriptural standard, but you might imagine that there could be some men who would take advantage of this and be straight up mistreating the women. So they were wrestling through this, and that's why they brought up this question, hey, um, I'll do the paraphrase version, hey, can a man divorce his wife for any reason? Remember what Jesus actually did in his answer. He returned us to God's own creation standard and original design, but then Jesus also introduces an exception clause of his own, except for sexual immorality. Now, I need to mention an aside. It was briefly alluded to, but I need to mention it and make it more explicit. With all this wrestling with the issue of divorce, the issue of hardness of heart and the sinfulness of people's heart does lead to concessions. In a few moments, we're going to get to a scriptural concession that Paul includes in 1 Corinthians 7. I went back to Deuteronomy for a reason, but some of you might be like, hey, that's Old Testament. That doesn't really apply. Jesus is saying some new things. If you're able to make the connections in your mind, great. If you're not, I just wanted to give you an example from the interaction in Matthew when Jesus is speaking, an interaction from Deuteronomy related to the Mosaic law because that's what prompted the question an interaction that we're going to get to later from Paul, which is a New Testament preacher who's wrestling through this issue of divorce, just like we in modern times have to wrestle through it. But with all of that, what is the main thing? 
what God originally said at creation. Make sense? We cool? Before we get moving, let me look at the eyes, see if you're glossing over. Okay. Before we move forward to present times, it's not really present times, but the present times of 1 Corinthians, I want to read to you what a commentator by the name of Warren Wearsby writes regarding the concession that was made in Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 through 4. We must note one final fact before leaving this section. The divorce that Moses permitted in Deuteronomy 24 actually severed the original marriage relationship. God permitted the woman to marry again, and her second marriage was not considered adulterous. The second man was called a husband and not an adulterer. Just know, because the way this message sounds, you might not have been hearing this, just know that remarriage is indeed a valid option after what we might term a scripturally valid divorce. We don't encourage that because we have the high view of God's word. Let man not uh, put asunder what God has put together. But just know that as you wrestle through scripture, that is a valid option after what we might term a scripturally valid divorce. So while there will be genuine men of God that come to slightly different conclusions regarding marriage, divorce, and remarriage, all should have a high view of marriage. Also, all of these men of God who are communicating should also have a high hatred for sin. And here's another warning that if it hasn't been made explicit, I need to say as well. If you are experiencing physical and emotional abuse in your marriage, you need to come out from under that. Even if there is not cheating or sexual immorality, you need to get out from that because that is not a faithfulness to the marriage covenant. So even if for some reason in good conscience you cannot allow yourself to divorce because of the view you take on scriptures, you still are going to need to seek the appropriate aid and help to foster a separation and come out from under that abuse. Regarding Moses' allowance of divorce, uh, author by the name of Michael J. Wilkins writes, Since sinful abuse of a marriage partner was a harsh reality in the ancient world, Moses instituted a regulation designed to do three things. One, protect the sanctity of marriage from something indecent defiling the relationship. Two, protect the woman from a husband who might simply send her away without any cause. And three, document her status as a legitimately divorced woman so that she would not be thought a harlot or a runaway adulteress. Let's get to what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians uh, 7. We're going to start in verse uh, 12. It'll be 1 Corinthians uh, 7, verses 12 through 15. Uh, this is Paul writing. Uh, this is from the English Standard Version. Actually, let's start in verse 10. I made a mistake. Uh, my apologies for that. Verses 10 through 15. To the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband. But if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and the husband should not divorce his wife. Verse 12, to the rest I say, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. That's 1 Corinthians 7, verses 10 through 15. In verses 10 through 11, we see again a servant of God emphasizing a high view of marriage and the avoidance of seeing divorce as a quick go to. Even the verse 12 through 14 thinking is rooted in a high view of marriage. Yet in verse 15, there's the acknowledgement of the real life stuff that happens when dealing with marriages that come to an end for a reason other than death. Even if you entered marriage too presumptuously, even if you are married to an unbeliever, God can bring good of your one flesh relationship. Even if you're on a second or third marriage, cherish God's blessing over marriage 
and allow him to bring good of it. Even if you're in a position in which you are divorced, whether no fault of your own or all your faults, receive God's forgiveness and be one who has a high view of marriage. Whether you are single by choice or single and wondering why your life partner hasn't arrived yet, maintain a high view of marriage and allow God to do good in this current season of life. Friends, let's remember who Jesus is. Jesus is he who confirms the goodness of being created male and female. Jesus is he who uplifts both marriage and singleness. Jesus is he who values the little children. Single or married, divorced or not, widowed or not, do not ever feel that you are one whose life cannot be touched by Jesus. I'm going to pray in a few moments, but remember the sermon is not done when I conclude the prayer because there is one more question from the kids from earlier that I want to share to you to answer with, and that's going to serve as our closing. But let's pray this morning. Lord, I pray that you're healing hearts in a way that is beyond our expectation. This can be a heavy message, and even though we have a conversational tone and we also have a high view of Scripture, this is a message where even if it's tried to be avoided, people can really feel like they're being preached at and talked down to. May your spirit be doing the work that you need to do in each one of our lives, reminding us of your beautiful grace, but also reminding us to encourage uh, those around us to continue to fix our eyes on you, Jesus, the author, effect, or source, and goal of their faith, but also to have that high view of marriage and to have a wonderful and high respect for their sisters and brothers in Christ, both those who are married and unmarried, both those who are divorced and not divorced, those who are widowed and not the very widowed, those who are seeking and those who want to go to distance not being married. Lord, just may there be a camaraderie between brothers and sisters in Christ as we wrestle through these issues according to what your word says, but also as we process through it together with fellow believers. And Lord, may we be those who always hear that gospel message speaking over us that you have come to lift our burdens and you have come that we could have life and have it to the full. It's in Jesus' name that we do indeed pray. Amen. Another question the children asked is, will I go to heaven? If you're at an age in which you are coming to understand what sin is, you will go to heaven if you admit that you are a sinner, believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he died on the cross for you, and then rose again, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and commit your life to living for him. The way this question is asked, I can't really answer, because only you and God know the true answer to that. You know what? I actually accepted Jesus when I was a little older than most of you, shortly before I turned 12 years old. An adult had asked me a longer question, but it was very similar to, are you saved, and will you be going to heaven? He then said, I think so, but you have to be sure for yourself. If you trust Jesus as the forgiver and leader in your life, you will be saved and go to heaven. However, if you talk more with your parents, read the Bible, connect with church, and even learn more about Jesus, you will be able to have confidence you're going to heaven based on what Jesus has said and done and how you have responded to what he has said and done. John 10, verses 27 through 30 reads, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Awesome. Awesome. Um, thank you guys so much. So I mean, I love, thank you, Randolph, so much. I appreciate whenever he comes and proclaims the word of God, which is awesome. Um, and also the fact that he got to teach on this difficult topic and I didn't have to is also awesome. Um, but once again, I mean, topics like this, like it's, it's in the Bible for a reason, right? And some of you may feel like, dude, this is so far from where I am at this stage in life. I don't, I don't know why we're going through this because as believers, like people aren't just going to come to their pastor for advice, right? When your friend is going through a really, really rough patch in their marriage, who are they going to come to for advice? They're going to come to you for advice. 
And instead of just this guttural, well, I think you should do this. I don't care what you think. What does God say, right? Like, this is what I want you guys to be able to teach. So we're teaching you guys to be able to counsel and advise and share that burden with one another so that we have a biblical view of marriage, a biblical view of scripture, a biblical view of reconciliation. And we're able to point people towards that because for too long, the church has just done what they wanted. And then the pastor preaches what they wanted. And there's this divide between the church being the body of believers versus the church being one man saying, but that's not what the, the Bible says the church is. We're the gathering of believers, and we want brothers and sisters in Christ to edify and encourage and build up and continue to point people towards Christ. So um, thank you so much, Randolph. Um, Let me pray one more time real quick um, as we close things out, and then we've got tons of food for you guys. So let's pray. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for your provision. Um, Thank you for just bringing people to come, just continue to put our focus on you and just providing each and every step of the way. God, since day one, you have been providing in miraculous ways. Um, God, I pray that we never become self-sufficient or dependent on ourselves, but that we just rely on you and trust that your ways are better than our ways. God, like small children who think that we know best for our lives as we run out into traffic or touch the stove that's hot, you are the good Father who is looking over us. You are pointing us to say this way to life, this way to life, this way to life, and I pray that we would trust you when you speak, Lord. We love you and thank you in your holy, precious name we pray. Amen. Love you guys. Be blessed and be blessing. We've got breakfast burritos, bagels, breakfast sandwiches, um, coffee inside. If you guys want coffee, I'll probably make a big batch of mine mochas right now. But um, yeah, stick around, guys. We've got some fun stuff.